I was just talking to Tara, who's been taking such good care of me, and I said, God is on a roll, and there's more coming. <laughs> he has great things. When his people gather, he always shows up and does his stuff, and so I'm really excited about what he's going to continue to do in this session. And I just want to say to Pastor Jerry and Pastor Kimberly, you guys are amazing. I, what a joy, what a privilege to be in this house and to see your ministry. And we are so blessed already. Todd and I are so impressed with the courage, the humility, the passion. Your message last night was just incredible. And you know, what I love so much was he shared his heart and he shared vulnerably about the real deal <laughs> of what it means to go out and make time to play basketball with a kid when you're busy and tired right? And love people like that. So thank you for the model and the example that you give. And we're super, super honored, Tom and I, to be able to be here with you and partner in some way with the vision dream that God's placed in your heart. And Jesus Disciple, wow, what an app. I am super excited. That's amazing. And uh, Nicole, your message was so, so right on. So um, yeah, I wouldn't have to say anything more and you guys could go home blessed, but God always has more for us. <laughs> so I know he's going to do more, but I also wanted to just commend you as a church and as a house here for sending, sending your best. A lot of people want to keep their best, but this is a house that sends their best. And uh, Todd and I had the privilege of one of the movements that we're coaching and working with in West Africa. We were there. It's an area that has many, many Muslims in the area. It's, they're very uh, violent in their violent Muslim area. And we had a, a privilege of uh, training them for a, a few days. And at the end of that training, we, we gave a call to go to what we call them the cousins, um, to their Muslim cousins who are neighbors in their country. And we had 11 stand up and say, I'll go. And that means that they're not just willing to step out of their comfort zone, they're willing to die. They know that to go means that they may die. And what Nicole talked about, the cost is real. If we're gonna reach the unreached, if we're going to reach those who've never heard, there is a price to pay. But people are rising up and saying, I'll go. Because what Jesus did for me is he died for me, and I'm willing to go wherever he calls me and do whatever he says. And that house, that movement, is a, is a growing movement. They said, and we will send you. And we will pray for you. And we will be there for you when you come home beaten and broken. And we will pray and we will cover you and we will be with you. And I see this house doing the same. You're sending people out. You're going out yourselves, and, and you're going there together. So I wanna really affirm and commend you for that. And um, yeah, so I wanna talk today about keys to a massive kingdom impact, even if you're not famous, rich, or super talented. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, God loves to use ordinary people to have an incredible impact on the world around them. He delights in doing that. He loves to use people like you and people like me who are just ordinary people. We're not super famous. We're not rich. We're not even super talented. We don't have any money maybe, but he delights in using the ordinary to do the extraordinary. It's part of who he is. And he's doing this in an increasing way today. Ordinary people plus simple faith plus obedience equals a massive impact. Let me say it one more time. Ordinary people plus simple faith plus obedience equals a massive impact. So I'm assuming most of you are not rich, famous, or super talented. Um, maybe some of you are, I don't know. Maybe there are some people in here who are multimillionaires, that's fine, nothing against you. Or maybe there's people who are, you know, uh, movie stars or something, but famous soccer players like the picture shows. 
That's okay, God can use you too. But he loves to use those of us who look at ourselves and we think, I am as ordinary as I get. (laughs) I don't have much to offer in and of myself. I'm not gifted, I'm not crazy talented, but God delights in using people like you and I. I'm also assuming that you are someone, because you're here in this conference giving up your time, who is passionate about knowing God and making him known to others. Would that be you? You say, I'm ordinary, but I'm passionate for God. I want to know him more, and I want to make him known to others. And you're also someone who loves people, and you long for his healing to come in their lives. Those are the things he's looking for. Well, I want to tell you, you are in the right place tonight, today, if you deeply desire to see God do something more than you're currently seeing. Do you have that hunger for more? Maybe you've seen great things already, but you want more. You know there needs to be more. You know that the, the lostness around you demands that there be more. And you're, you're longing, you're desiring for God to do more through your life than you're currently seeing. And you're ready to embrace change. We just had this clarion call from Nicole to be willing to do things differently, to pivot. You're willing and ready to embrace change and willing to take some risks in order to move forward. What, Pastor Jerry, you're doing, it's risky. <laughs> It's risky to say, I want everyone here to be a disciple maker. But it's what God's asking of you. And you're saying yes to him. If you're that person, I want to tell you today that God has absolutely incredible things ahead for you. Absolutely incredible things. And before I go into sort of the meat of my message, I want to tell you a little bit more about this very, very ordinary person who's lived a kind of unusual life named Cynthia Anderson. So uh, just so you can get to know me, I think it helps. I'm going to be here for a few days. And um, I'm a missionary kid. I was born in Nigeria, West Africa. Um, I was born in the middle of a war. And uh, we were evacuated from that country when I was a year old. But we went, came back to the States. Um, My family is from Lawrence, Kansas. And then my dad, after some time, we went back to the mission field. We went to the country of Ghana and also lived in Liberia as a child. I loved being a missionary kid. Um, My dad bought me a new animal every birthday. So I had my own little zoo on the mission field. I had monkeys and I had anteaters and I had all kinds of different animals, parrots that whistled in harmony when we would sing. I mean, crazy things. It was a lot of fun. Um, Growing up as a missionary kid on the field in West Africa, and the country where we were living when I was 13 years old was the country of Liberia. And uh, we were in Liberia when there was a military coup, and um, I went to an American school there. Uh, Many of the ministers of government, their children went to school with me, were in my classes, and there was a military coup where they took over the country. Uh, This guy went into the armory, had the keys to the armory, shot the president, shot a bunch of the ministers of government. Our friends fled for their lives, and our family was evacuated from Liberia in a very sensitive time. As you know, 13 is kind of a hard period of time in life anyway. We came back and plopped back down in Lawrence, Kansas, and um, it it was hard. You know, and we had been through a lot of trauma. It was before the days of even knowing what member care was, you know, (laughs) to take care of kids who go through trauma like that or families. But I went into an American high school, and at that time I thought, I never, in fact, I made what I now know is called an inner vow. I never want to live someplace that isn't safe. And uh, this, you know, I, I wanted to... I did well in academics, so I went to, we moved to Minnesota, which is where I met my husband, Todd, and I was pursuing at the university to be a Rhodes Scholar, and I wanted to be a teacher of English. And then, my sophomore year of college, God spoke to me, and um, 
Well, it was partly gone. It was partly this itch to travel that missionary kids have. <laughs> and I decided to go on a missions trip. And I went on a missions trip to Thailand and Singapore. And when I was there, I encountered unreached people for the first time as an adult. And it rocked my world. And I was like, there are millions who have never heard about Jesus, ever, even once. They don't even know a Christian. And how can I go back and live my little white picket fence life when there are millions who have never heard? And I couldn't. And I knew that God was calling me to give my life to reaching unreached people. And so Todd and I met and married. We went back uh, to Asia. And after doing a discipleship training school with YWAM, we went to the country of Nepal. Um, it was challenging and fun and crazy and adventurous. <laughs> and we would ride our little scooter. We had a scooter at that time, no vehicle with our baby in our front pack in the monsoon rains, up the mountain, down the mountain, to get to this valley area that was about, uh, it was about three hours outside of the capital, Kathmandu. And that's where we began to do our work of church planning. And it took us about three years, uh, sorry, about three months, to find anyone in that valley who had ever heard the name of Jesus. That's how unreached it was. What a joy, what a privilege to, to be the first people <laughs> to share Jesus with people who'd never heard before. And we would sit in these little tea shops and drink chai, Nepali chai, and practice our Nepali, and we would share about Jesus, and we would open the Bible and read Bible stories. And we finally had met this one man who actually came to know the Lord in the country of, Bur of Bhutan, where he was working as a migrant worker. And he opened his house to us. He was a person of peace. And he called others to come and listen to our message. And we began to disciple him and some young men there. And we didn't know what we were doing, to be honest. A movement started there by the grace of God, <laughs> kind of by accident. And you know, I just want to encourage you, you don't have to do everything right to, to see a movement. <laughs> okay, because it's something God does. And God did it through us. And we were, we were discipling these young men. And then this was before the days of WhatsApp and Facebook and any of those social media things. And we had a new baby that had been born in Nepal that had never met her grandparents. And so we decided we needed to go back to America for a time and introduce our baby <laughs> to her grandma and grandpa. And we went back and we, we had this little group that had started, people who'd believed in Jesus, mostly young men, about 16, 17 years old. And we said to them, we said, this is your church. It's not our church. And this is your people. Now go out and make disciples of them. And we commissioned them to be disciple makers and to go out and start more groups like what we had started with them and go tell people about Jesus. And we're going to go back, but we're coming back. And when we come back, we want to see what God did through you. And so we came back after some months, and honestly, I prayed every day for that group, and I had no idea if when we came back, it would have dissolved, <laughs> you know, what would happen. But we came back, and, and by God's grace, when we came back and we met them, they said to us, Cindy Didi and Todd Daju, that's what they call us in Nepali, they said, there are 35 people that we've led to the Lord, and they're ready to be baptized. So would you come and baptize them? And we said, no. That's your job. <laughs> but we'll show you how. And so we, we taught them how to baptize. We did a little practice thing, and the first one I think we might have baptized, but then they baptized the rest of them, and it was their church, and it was their movement. And that movement continued to spread and continued to grow in that valley area. And today, that valley that we went to that took us three months to find anyone who heard the name of Jesus before, today it's more than 10% Jesus followers. So we give praise to God. We give praise to God. We moved over to India. Actually, we lost our visa um, through a series of circumstances and had to move. We didn't know. We knew we weren't supposed to come back to America, so 
we're like, well, India is the neighboring country. We have friends there. We'll just cross the border and try to figure out what God wants to do. And to be 100% honest, I don't know if there's any Indians here or watching online, or, um, but we didn't like India at first. It was hard. We moved to a city that, I don't know, do any of you remember the Lonely Planet? It's the old travel guide they used to have when you used to go places. Anyway, the Lonely Planet said about our city, it said, get out of there as soon as possible. <laughs> okay, it was not a beautiful Himalayan, you know, gorgeous place. It was hot, it was humid, it was dirty, it was dusty. But that's where we plopped down, and I hated it. And I was like, God, please speak quickly where we're supposed to go next <laughs> because I don't like it here. And actually, I had a bit of a prejudice that had developed in my heart towards India because Nepalis don't like Indians. And as we had worked you know, in Nepal for so many years and that had kind of come into my heart. And, and one day I was sitting outside and I was praying and I, I felt like, God, I don't like these people. <laughs> Please let us go back to Nepal or let us go somewhere else. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Cindy, are you willing to love who I love? And I said, Lord, I can't do it on my own because there is no natural love in my heart for the people of the city. But Lord, if you will put your love in my heart, I'm willing to love who you love. You gotta do it, Lord. It's gotta be a work of your spirit. And you know what? When we pray a prayer like that, he answers. Yes. And God began to put his love in our heart for the people of India. And we stayed in that city for 14 years. It was our home and we love India and we love Indian people and we raise up many, many church planners and we worked in the slums there and there's a picture there. We, we did slum ministry and widow's ministry and, and God moved, but it, it wasn't us. It was his love in us that began to work there. There's so much more I could share about our stories and maybe one day I will, but um, today we're based in Thailand. We've been there for eight years. And after we had worked in India and led YWAM Frontier Missions work for South Asia, uh, we raised up Indian leaders, which is always our job to raise up others, and we handed over to them. And with joy, we moved on to Thailand, and that's where we're currently based. And God has done some amazing things in Thailand, but mostly we're working, we're basing there and working globally today. And uh, Cindy, I don't know if you're here, I met a Thai, Thai woman and excited to partner with her, but uh, God's doing great things in Thailand. So that's a little bit about this ordinary person who's lived an extraordinary life in God, because he loves to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. I want to ask you a question, what would it look like, or what would it feel like if you could look back at your life a few years from now and say, wow, I never dreamed God could do that through me. Just imagine, what would that feel like? What if, what if there's a day ahead where you're gonna look back and say, I never dreamed God could do that through me, but he has, he has. Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring you the future you hope for. God. <laughs> God says that to you today. He knows the plans he has for you, and I want to guarantee you they're bigger than what you can dream because his word says that. He has plans for your life to use you for his kingdom in ways that are far beyond what you can imagine. Far beyond. They're good plans. But you know, in order to move into his purposes, one of the first keys to unlocking kingdom impact is we have to know who we are. We have to know who we are, our identity. Now again, remember, we're gonna get rid of the lie that says you have to be rich, 
famous or super talented to be used of God, right? We're gonna get rid of that and we're gonna remind ourselves of who we are. So who are we? There's three things that I want you to remember today about who you are and there's many more we could talk about. The first one is that you are a royal priest. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you are a royal priest. Some of you didn't turn. Turn to your neighbor and say it to the other neighbor. You are a royal priest. Okay, and now just to be a, a little quirky, can you do something for me? Can you, can you make like a crown and put it on your head and say, I am a royal priest? Okay, this is just to help you remember it, okay? I am a royal priest. I am a royal priest. Now, 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are a royal priest. Now, what does that mean? Let's unpack that for just a minute. Well, Todd and I lived in the nation of Nepal, which had a king. We've lived in Thailand, which has a king currently. And if you're part of the royalty, that is like a big deal, <laughs> okay? If you're part of the royal family in Thailand, when somebody talks to you, they actually use a different level of language, okay? So when you are royal, you have automatic authority. Anywhere you go, you can walk in and you can speak with authority. And people actually have to honor you, right? Because you're royal, right? So this is a Bible telling us we are royal. We're part of the royal family. You've been adopted by the king of kings. You are royal. That means that nobody can say you don't have authority to do stuff. You're a part of the king's family. And you go in that authority. Thanks, God. He's, he's made you royal. Now, the second part of that is you're a royal priest. Now, we don't, we don't have priests so much, you know, especially in, for, in this four square tradition or the tradition I come from. You know, we don't have priests, but in the Old Testament, there were priests. And in Hinduism, there are priests. In fact, in Hinduism, we worked among Hindus for many, many years. The priests are called the Brahmins. Brahmins are a priestly caste, right? We have the caste system. You have the high caste or the Brahmins. You have the middle caste. The next caste down are the Chetriya, which are the warrior caste. And then you have a bunch of working classes, and then you have low caste, right? So that's the way the caste system works. So the Brahmins are the priests. And you have to be born a Brahmin to do any kind of work of religious nature, right? You can't, you can't be educated into Brahmanism or to become a Hindu priest. You have to be born a Hindu priest. Well, it's very similar in, in some ways to the Old Testament system of the Levites, right? You couldn't be trained to become a Levite. You had to be born a Levite, right? And, and they were the caste or the people group, or you might say the tribe, that did the work of the ministry. And everybody else wasn't quite as able to get close to God as the, the Levites were, right? But when Jesus came, there was a new covenant. And when Jesus died on that cross, what happened? The curtain was torn from top to bottom and every single Jesus follower has equal access to the throne of grace. Amen? Amen? That's right. We are all priestly cast. <laughs> we are all priests of God. There is no high and there is no low. We're all equal before the throne of grace. We're equally called, we're equally anointed. Each one of you have been given spiritual gifts that God wants to use for his glory because you are royal and you're a priest of God. Okay, there's no high, there's no low. Now, sometimes we've gotten a little confused. And some people, you know, our tendency, Nicole talked about our traditions and ways that we're comfortable with. And we like to have, you know, pastors up here and ordinary people kind of down here. 
that's kind of an Old Testament way of living, right? Because every single person is anointed by God to be a royal priest. That's what First Peter says. You are a royal priest. So put your hands up there one more time. I am a royal priest. Say it like you mean it. I am a royal priest. <laughs> oh, forgive me. I won't make you like write a song about this like I, like I had our Kenyans do, but if you want to write a song about it, feel free. Uh, you are a royal priest. Number two, you are chosen by God to bear fruit. Say to your neighbor, you were chosen to bear fruit. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give it to you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that's true about you? It is, because that's what God's word says. God chose you. He didn't just choose you to be someone who attends church. He chose you to be a fruit-bearing Christian, follower of Jesus. He chose you and he appointed you that you might bear not just a little fruit, but much fruit and fruit that would last. That's your destiny. That's That's who God has called you to be. That is who you are, my friends. You are fruit bearers, chosen to bear much fruit. Now, I don't want you to knock the person next to you in the face, okay? So be a little careful as you do this, but stretch out your hands like you're a tree with some fruit, okay? Now say, I'm chosen chosen to bear fruit. fruit. I'm a royal priest. I'm I'm chosen chosen to bear fruit. fruit. All right, you got it? You're going to remember it? (laughs) Okay. All right. That's who you are, my friends. Don't let anybody tell you. Somebody, you go out and you baptize somebody that you led to the Lord and they say, who gave you authority to do this? Jesus did. He said, I chose you and I appointed you. We are chosen and appointed by Jesus himself. And lastly, you are a trainer of trainers. Matthew 28, Great Commission, 18 to 20 says, Go and make disciples of who? All nations. nations. What to say next? No. Before that? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And? Teaching. Teaching them to obey all that I commanded. Right? We're to go. That means we're gonna have to step out. Might be across the street. It might be across your desk at work. Might be to Memphis, it might be to Iraq, it might be to Thailand, I don't know where God's gonna call you, but we're to go and we're to make disciples of all nations. And then we're to baptize them. Now, some people like to talk about the go and make disciples part and then cross out the baptize part. Well, that's other people do that. (laughs) You get a copy of my book. One of the mindset shifts is that baptism is for all, by all. And some of the movements that we're seeing in Indonesia, this is what they do. Somebody comes to faith and they baptize them. Then they say, okay, now you're going to practice baptizing. So now you baptize me. They baptize the baptizer to practice. Because in a little while, you're going to lead somebody to faith and you're going to baptize them. Isn't that crazy? Baptism for all, by all, because it's in the Great Commission, right? And because you're a royal priest. The work of the ministry is not just for the high caste. It's for all. It's for everyone, right? Now, you guys talk to Pastor Jerry and Kimberly, if that's okay here, you know, I want you to honor what is your system here, but I think I heard him talk about that last night. You know, with his blessing and with his, um, you know, is permission. <laughs> you guys follow what, what your pastor teaches and tells you, but you are a trainer of trainers. Right there, inherent in the Great Commission, it says, teach them to know everything I commanded. Is that what it says? It says obey. Teach them to obey 
all that I've commanded, including the Great Commission. Right? So what does that mean? It means that every disciple should be making disciples who make disciples. Do you get it? It's right there. Right in the Great Commission. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded. So you are trainers of trainers. You are disciplers of disciplers. You are equippers of equippers. Don't just think about the first generation. Now, I love that you guys are initiating the Jesus Disciple app, and I hope everyone in here starts at least one group, like Nicole said. Imagine if everyone in this room started at least one group. But I wanna take it just one step further, if you allow me, because I'm a multiplication coach, right? And we can't just think about the first generation. You have to be praying for your disciples, disciples, disciples. You need to be, I'm a grandma, I've got three, now I have to update that profile, three grandkids, and I pray for my grandkids, right? We pray for our grandchildren, pray for your spiritual grandchildren, right? Pray for the ones that those who you disciple will lead to Christ and will disciple, and those that they disciple will lead to others. Right? We have to aim for multiplication. We have to believe that God has called every single one of us not just to be disciple makers, but to make disciples who will make disciples, who will make disciples. Amen? So, okay. I am a royal priest. I'm chosen by God to bear fruit. And I am a trainer of trainers. Okay. Now, don't shake your hands at people when you train them, okay? That's just to help you remember it, okay? So that is who you are. We need to know our identity. That's key number one. Key number two, I'm not going to talk a lot about today uh, because on Sunday I'm going to speak about this in particular, but key number two to having a kingdom impact is a vision to affect lostness. A vision to affect lostness. People change mindsets. People change paradigms for one of two reasons. It's either pain or passion. It's either pain or passion. And I'm gonna talk more about that on Sunday. The pain of lostness needs to grip our heart afresh. It's a key. You can, you can have all the right tools, all the best resources. You can have all the knowledge and skills to make disciples. But if lostness doesn't grip your heart, you're not gonna see movements. Lostness has to grip our hearts afresh. The brokenness of people around us. We need to ask God to give us his heart. How much does lostness bother us? How much does it bother you? Does it wake you up in the night? the fact that your neighbors haven't heard about Jesus yet? Does it bother you enough to get uncomfortable and into that spiritual conversation with that person that you know might think you're really weird if you talk to them about Jesus? Does lostness bother you enough to push you out when you're tired, when you've already worked a long day, and you come home and God says, go for a prayer walk in your neighborhood? because I'm gonna lead you to a person of peace if you'll just get out there. Does lostness bother us enough to push us out among those who don't know Jesus? Lostness needs to grip our hearts afresh. I wanna ask us to ask God to break our hearts with what breaks his. Let's ask God to break our hearts with what breaks his. And I want to invite you to pray that same prayer I did. Lord, right now, I don't love them that much. And lostness doesn't grip my heart that much. But if you'll put your heart in me, I'm ready to receive it. Fill me with the passion that burns in your heart for lost people. Because I need it, God. I need it because it's not the tools that's gonna get you out there when you're tired and busy. It's a grip on your heart of the grip of God for those who don't know him and his love that laid down his life for them. 
that would say, I'll do it too, Lord. I want to be like you. I want to follow you. Give me your heart for lost people. I want to invite you right now, even before we move on to the next point, would you just join me in asking God, just open your hands up and say, God, give me your heart for lost people. I want to just pray over you as a house, Lord. I pray that you will grip our hearts with the pain that is in your heart for those who are away from you. They're your kids, they're your creation. You, You gave your very life, Lord Jesus, that they would be rescued from their brokenness. And you have healing for them. And it, It's such a deep pain in your heart, God, that they don't know about you. Lord, I pray that you would would do a miraculous work in each one of our hearts afresh. God, would you grip our hearts with your heart for the lost? Lord, I invite you to wake me up in the middle of the night to pray for my neighbor. Lord, I invite you to propel me out to talk to them and invite them over. I ask God that you would you would stir us, Lord, with such a passion and such a pain that God, it would resemble yours. Lord, make us like you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Key number three. We're moving, I'm gonna start moving a little more quickly here, but key number three. Everyone makes disciples. In every movement that I've seen around the world, this is one of the characteristics of it. Everyone is engaged in making disciples. The Great Commission calls every disciple to be a disciple maker. It's his design. It's how he created us to function. We weren't created to just come to church and be churchgoers. We are created and designed to be his ambassadors, to be his, his representatives in the world. That's who he designed and called you to be. That is your destiny. And yet we worry about filling seats in churches. Now, I know this church is concerned about a lot more than that. But many, many churches in our nation are more worried about who they can get in the building than about what those people do when they leave. Am I right? Yeah, Jesus never commanded us to fill buildings or seats. He commanded us to make disciples. We must empower and equip every disciple to make disciples. And that those new disciples would make more disciples. This is essential, it's his, it's his design, it's how Jesus designed things to work. True disciples who obey Jesus are radically in love with God and they love their neighbors and their communities as well. Now imagine with me for a moment, what would it look like, as Nicole said, if everyone in here started a group of disciples and those groups started other groups and those groups started other groups and those people fell in love with Jesus and their lives were transformed I started obeying everything in his word immediately and passing it on to others around them. What kind of transformation would we see in Anaheim? What kind of things do we see begin to change? Don't you long for that? You know, it's happening around the world. Ordinary disciples, they're meeting together. They're studying the word in simple ways and then they're just obeying it and it's starting to spread. I want to tell you, as we come close to the end, and we're going to have a time of response, but about how a movement started in India with someone that we were working with, and it was in South India, and there was a young couple, they had a new baby, and uh, we're going to call him Dan, I won't say his real name for security purposes, but Dan and his wife, they they got a heart for making disciples and the Great Commission, so they, they went to this new city, much like Nicole's said yes and gone to Memphis. And they went to this new city and they, they used to get up every morning and walk the streets of the city. They didn't have a car or anything, but they just got up and they would walk every street and they would pray. 
and they carried their little baby from 5 a.m. to 6, sometimes 7 a.m. They would walk the streets praying, God, do something in our city. Do something in our city. Lead us to a person of peace. And they would walk and they would pray. They did that for about four months every single day, walking and praying, laying a foundation of prayer. Prayer is a foundation of disciple-making movements. And then one, one day, they met a family who were sitting out on their porch as they were walking and praying. They started talking to them, said namaste, and greeted them. And as they got to know this family, the family said, oh, uh, our daughter is very, very sick. And they came to know about that. And they said, what happened? And they said, no, she's had this problem of bleeding. She was about 13 years old. And we've taken her to many, many doctors. No doctor can find out what's wrong. And she's very anemic. And We've, we've paid all the money we have. We've sold properties. We don't know what to do. And Dan and his wife said, well, we, we know a Jesus who heals the sick. Would you like us to pray for your daughter in his name? And they said, well, we've tried everything else. Sure. And uh, so they laid their hands on this little girl and prayed a simple prayer. Just Jesus, come and touch her and make her whole. And as they did that, the bleeding instantly stopped. Straight out of the book of Acts, huh? And so they were amazed. And they said, wow, we want to follow this Jesus. And he said, okay, let's let's start a Discovery Bible Study little group right here in your home. And they started to gather. And they called others to come and hear about Jesus. And they they were gathering in this home every, every week to hear about Jesus and the stories of Jesus and discuss it. And then there was another family that started coming who were from that neighborhood. And they were coming and they were hearing about Jesus, but they hadn't yet really fully left idolatry. You know, they were kind of in the journey. And the the wife of this family had a heart attack and she died. And so they called up the church planner, Dan, and they said, Dan, our mama has just died. Can your Jesus do anything? And Dan said, I'm on the way. Now, those are not fun phone calls to get. And he didn't know what to do, but he knew that he should go. And so he went, and he went to the house, and the house was, again, just like out of the New Testament. And in India, it's a lot like that, you know? And the body was in the back room, and people were wailing, and people had gathered. and, And Dan went into the back room where the body was, and he said, he asked everybody to leave. And he got down on his face and he began to cry out to God. Jesus, would you do a miracle? These people need to know who you are. Would you show your power? Would you show your glory to them? Would you show them that you love them? And he, he prayed for quite a while. I don't know exactly how long it was, but he prayed and wept and cried out to God beside that body. And before long, the woman woke up she came back to life and Dan he called the people in you know and they're like and said here's your mama back Jesus has brought her back to life God did an incredible miracle because Dan was willing to pray and to believe that people needed to see the power of God there are people out there that need to know there's a God who answers prayer and Dan was willing to take that risky prayer And he prayed and God answered. And so quickly the movement began to spread and you know, people were calling Dan, his phone is ringing off the hook, you know, and all the time he's getting phone calls, come pray, come pray, and more people were getting healed. And they started within a few months, 10 new house churches. And then Dan came to a training that we were running and he was telling us about this. And he said, he said, Cindy, it's so exciting, but it's so exhausting. He said, because I'm like, my phone is ringing off all the time, and people are calling me here and there, and I'm always running, and I never have time for my wife and my kids anymore, and what am I going to do? God has done something great, but what am I going to do? And we said, Dan, <laughs> you've got to multiply disciples, and you need to train them to do what you do. Don't go everywhere when they call you. Tell them to go. <laughs> And train them how to pray for the sick and cast out demons and raise the dead and do these things that you know how to do. And he got it. 
And he said, yes, that's what I'm going to do. And he went back and everyone in those 10 house churches, he taught them to go start new house churches and to go pray for the sick and to go share the gospel. And it wasn't all on Dan to do all the work anymore. And the movement began to multiply. And uh, today it's in the sixth stream, you know, sixth generation, uh, thousands who've come into the kingdom there. And another exciting thing was trafficking, child trafficking and labor was a big problem there. And um, when people started coming to the Lord and it started spreading like that, they, they didn't want to give their kids up for trafficking anymore. They started sending their kids to school. And pretty soon the traffickers wouldn't let Dan come to that area anymore. And he said, you know what, I don't need to go because they're already doing it. <laughs> Praise God. What's the answer to human trafficking problems? Jesus. Jesus. Making disciples of Jesus whose lives are transformed. God's going to do those kinds of things through you guys here too. Everyone is getting involved in making disciples, not just big famous pastors and leaders. Everyone is loving and serving their neighbors, sharing simple testimonies, inviting people to read the Bible, to do the Jesus disciple discovery groups, story groups, and to learn more. Super quick review, what is a disciple making movement? You guys seen these pictures before? The elephant and the rabbit? You guys familiar with that, right? Yeah. Not, everybody Not everybody. Okay, so there's two kinds, of, two kinds of churches, right? We have rabbit churches and we have elephant churches. What's the difference between a rabbit and an elephant? One's big, one's little. Yeah, yeah. One's majestic, bum, 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 you know, when it goes through the forest. In Africa, we love elephants. They're our pride in Thailand, too. We're proud of elephants. They're amazing creatures. But they can only have a couple of babies in their lifetime. Now, rabbits, on the other hand, they multiply like crazy, right? And uh, when you try to chase them, what do they do? They hide under the bush, right? And you can't find them, and they scutter off. And, you know, they just multiply so rapidly, and the gestation period of a rabbit is so short compared to an elephant. So we want to start rabbit churches. <laughs> Amen? Amen? We want to start rabbit groups, groups that multiply rapidly where we are. Characteristics of a movement is it's fast growing. Some people are afraid of rapid growth. They think, oh, people won't become mature. But I want to tell you, in these movements, people are mature in Christ. They know their Bibles. They know their Bibles better than a lot of pastors know their Bibles because they are studying it every day and they are passing it on to others. And when you tell a story to someone else, you learn it more deeply, yeah. right? right? And God's going deep with these people, right? So we're seeing rapid multiplication happen. In, they're indigenous of the local culture. They're multiplying, not just adding. And again, I want to stay on you guys a little bit. <laughs> We want to see these groups multiply, not just adding. Adding's the first step. You know, we've got to start some first generation groups. But we gotta see those groups multiply if we're gonna address the lostness in this area. And then they're obedient. Immediate obedience to the word is a characteristic of disciple making movements. And that's costly. It's costly, but we have to be willing to immediately obey and put into practice what we've learned. Every disciple can learn to multiply disciples. No more filling pews. Are you with me? No more just inviting people to church and thinking that means we're this amazing evangelist because we had enough courage to invite someone to church. Are you with me? Yeah, no, it's time to make disciples and to train them until they can make more disciples. This is a call that Jesus gives us in his word. Okay, last key. I've got less than 10 minutes. I got that clock back there, so. Last key is the pass it on principle. Share everything you receive. Now I've got some volunteers who are gonna come up here, if you would. Where's my three volunteers? All right, the pass it on principle, and I know you guys are familiar with this verse in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. 
but I just want to illustrate it to you for a minute. Second Timothy 2.2. 2. It says this, it says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others, okay? So you guys have probably been wondering why I brought this kind bar up here in case I get hungry in the middle of the message, right? No, okay, so 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is, is like this. So Paul is there, and you're gonna be Timothy, is that okay? I know, I don't know, I don't look like a Paul, and you don't look like a Timothy per se, but you play along. <laughs> okay, so Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, the things which you have heard and received from me I'm gonna give those to you. Now I want you to pass those on to faithful men. Does he look like a faithful guy? He does, yeah? Is he faithful? All right. Faithful men or women, and they're going to teach others also. All right? So this is the second Timothy pass it on principle. Okay? But this is what actually happens a lot of times. So Timothy, the things that you've heard and seen from me, I want you to teach them and entrust them to faithful men. Go ahead. Come on, he's so disobedient. Come on, entrust them to faithful men. What's wrong in this picture? I didn't let go, right? If we're gonna pass on to others, we have to pass on authority, we have to actually trust them that they're gonna do it, right? Now that's risky, right? But that's what God's calling us to do. Now let's try it one more time. Timothy, the things that I have, you've learned and received from me, pass it on to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. All right, and can you take that down and pass it on to somebody else? <laughs> Thank you, you guys. Trusting new believers is not super easy. Sometimes they, <laughs> sometimes they get it wrong. I had this one guy, I had taught him the story of David and Goliath and he went to tell the story to somebody else and they were out and I said, now you tell the story. He said, so there was this, uh, there was this guy named David and there was this guy named Goliath and he was from Iran and he was a Philistine. And, and I was like, where did you get that? You know, so they're gonna get it wrong sometimes, right? Um, you know, and he was a Muslim, he said, you know, all this crazy stuff. But anyway, it's okay because we trust new believers and we're there to correct, you know? but we have to challenge people to pass it on, right? Everything that you learn, everything you receive, pass it on to others. Teach people to pass on what they receive as part of the DNA of the group. And if they don't, don't scold them, but don't let them off the hook either, right? We keep on helping people to gain a new habit of passing on whatever they learn to others. So four keys to massive kingdom in, impact. And we can go ahead and have the team come up if they would, the worship team. <coughs> Identity, know who you are. You gotta know who you are. Who are you again? <coughs> Royal priest, <coughs> appointed by God to bear much fruit. <coughs> trainers of trainers, right? Know who you are. Care about who the lost are. We've gotta know who the lost are and allow God's heart to be in us. Everyone, recognize who your team will be. Your team could be anyone who's a follower of Jesus, right? Recognize everyone's gonna get involved and then the pass it on principle. Commit to immediately share what you learn with others. Ordinary people chosen by God can do absolutely extraordinary things. Can you say amen? Let's say it again. Ordinary people chosen by God can do absolutely extraordinary things. 
Let's say it one more time together. Ordinary people chosen by God can do absolutely extraordinary things by the power of his spirit. Are you ready for God to impact the world through you? Are you ready to see a massive kingdom impact here in this area, wherever you are, wherever God's called you to? I want you to just rise to your feet. Let's just tell him, let's just tell him, Lord, I want a massive kingdom impact. I'm not willing to just settle for a handful of believers because lostness demands that we see more. We've got to see movements. We've got to see multiplication. God, do it through me. I receive that identity. I receive that identity today. I am a royal priest. I want you to just declare it out. Open your mouth, declare it out to him. I'm a royal priest. I'm chosen. I'm chosen, God. I'm chosen by you to bear much fruit. I believe it today. I believe it today. Lord Jesus, I'm ordinary, but that's okay because you're extraordinary. You're extraordinary. Do miracles through me. God, I want to take risks to believe you for more. Yeah, open your mouths, cry out to God, my friends. Cry out to God. Let's tell him we're ready, we're willing, we're willing. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Do more through us, Lord. Oh God, we want more of you and we wanna be used by you in greater ways. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You guys have a song. And how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. How great is our God? He's able. He's able to raise the dead. He's able to set people free. How great is our somebody next to you and I want you to say pray prayers over them that you will you will make disciples who make disciples who make disciples you are somebody who will bear abundant fruit pray it over your neighbor pray it pray it out pray it over them commission them pray it over them yes Lord yes God yes God yes Lord yes Lord they will be a disciple maker they will walk in their identity.
want to ask you who you'll share what you just learned with. Because tomorrow when we come back, I'm going to ask you <laughs> if you did it. Because everything we receive is to be passed on. So I want you now to tell your neighbor, one person, that you're going to tell them who they are, at least those three things, before you come back tomorrow. Okay, can we do that? Can we make a commitment? You might text them or call them tonight, or I know the conference will go late, but we gotta share what we've been given. The pass it on principle is key to movement. So tell your neighbor who you're gonna share it with. Go ahead, tell them.